Um, in addition, I just want to call out um, my review partners. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, my name is Carla Young. Um, Nora Romo is here with us. Um, Nora was my first boss at CYFD and got me engaged in um, quality assurance. And so when she came on board, she was a huge asset to this team and um, really conducted the bulk of the case reviews. I also want to call out Judy Mayfield. Um, Judy is a um, partner of CYFD who conducts second level QA for their ongoing quality assurance. She has tons and tons of experience doing federal reviews. And so um, it was really critical to bring her on board and help us be very consistent to the CFSR process and consistent to the um, quality assurance process um, at CYFD. Um, next, I wanted to just acknowledge, um, sorry, I think I got to the, oh, I wanted to acknowledge our CYFD partners. Um, so we did this um, review in collaboration with CYFD. They supported us in accessing um, case records, um, participating in interviews, both for stakeholder interviews and for, um, for case related interviews. And they um, um, gave us access to specific data so that we could have a richer understanding of this review. Um, Natividad Posada, Jennifer Archuleta Earp, Sarah Meadows and Angela Baca. I want to do um, a special shout out to Angela Baca. She's the QA manager um, at CYFD, and she really supported us in being consistent with their review. Um, also, we want to call out our federal partners. This is a grant funded um, a program through the Children's Bureau, and the federal partners were key in assisting us in designing um, and implementing this review and supporting that process. Um, specifically Serena L. Williams, Ray Warsham, and the rest of the federal team. Um, and then lastly, I just want to uh, acknowledge everyone who participated in this review. I mean, many, many of you on this call either participated in stakeholder interviews or to um, um, participated in case-related interviews or both. And, you know, we can't understand um, a program through a qualitative review process unless we have people who are coming forward to give information, to say sometimes hard things, um, to give that feedback and to come with ideas. So thank you for everybody who participated in that program. Um, all right, so um, quickly, I wanna talk just about the NMFAP overview. Oh, I'm sorry, can you go back one, Corey? I think I'm one behind you, sorry. <laughs> um, thanks. So um, the, um, as you heard Leslie talk about, and I think most of you are very familiar with NMFAP, this is the New Mexico Family Advocacy Program. It's administered by the Administrative Office of the Courts here in New Mexico. It's funded through a grant awarded by the Children's Bureau, and it's an interdisciplinary model of legal representation. And that um, representation includes the respondent attorney, a master's level social worker, and in a select cases, um, a parent mentor. Um, and so this is unique um, in terms of how we think in New Mexico about parent representation. Um, the objectives of NMFAP are to improve parent engagement with the child welfare system and improve specific outcomes related to child permanency and well being. And that's where this. Um, this review came in. It's really um, taking some information and looking um, at how did we do meeting those objectives. Next slide. Um, so I uh, want to give you the highest level <laughs> overview of the child and family services reviews. Um, and I'm going to call your attention to round three. Um, as many of you in this community will be already hearing about or starting to hear about round four, that the next review is coming our way um, and that the Children's Bureau is working with states to implement round four reviews. Um, so that's coming. Um, for this particular review, we used all of the resources um, on the Children's Bureau site to inform the review utilizing round three resources. There's a couple reasons for that. One is that you know this review team hasn't yet been trained in round four. Um, round four, um, although some information has come out and there's some resources on the website, um, there hasn't been um, 
none of those reviews have been implemented yet. So everything's in the planning stage as, as to my knowledge at this point. Um, and it's my understanding that there will be a few changes to the process um, related to round four, just based on what I've read on the website. But all of the resources we're using um, were related to round three. And um, there is a link for all that information. So if you want to go deep dive on all the different particulars of CFSR, um, you can find it there on, on the website. Um, in terms of talking about what is CFSR, um, just directly from the Children's Bureau website, it explains that the Social Security Act was amended in 1994 authorizing the US Department of Health and Human Services to review state child and family services programs to ensure conformity with Title IV-E and Title IV-B of the Act. And in 2000, the Children's Bureau published the final rule on how those monitoring activities would take place. Okay, if that doesn't sound like <laughs> a bunch of federal legalese, then I don't know what is. Um, but um, basically it's just that this review process is authorized um, through the Social Security Act, and it's a process to ensure conformity with federal regulations. Um, beyond that, the purpose of the CFSR is really to help understand what families and children experience as they um, negotiate and, um, and work within the child welfare system. So what's really happening for them? Um, what states um, are doing that meets outcomes related to safety, permanency, and well being, and where there's certain areas needing improvement, and how to develop a plan for continuous quality improvement to meet those objectives. Um, the Child and Family Services Review, um, as it relates to families, looks at outcomes um, in terms of safety, permanency, and well being. And I'm sure many of you have heard those terms and are familiar with those different terms. And when we talk about the review we did, we are also looking at these outcomes, but we targeted the review specifically to um, areas that were expected to be impacted by the NMFAP. Next slide. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we specifically did for the NMFAP review. And then I'm gonna pause for a second just to see if there's any initial questions or comments. Um, for the NMFAP review, um, this was conducted as part of the grant evaluation process and for a continuous quality improvement of the program. Um, I wanna note for you all that this is not the only um, process um, and evaluation process being conducted by NMFAP. They have a very, very rigorous and ongoing um, evaluation process. And this particular review is just one aspect of that. Other sources include um, case file review, court observation, surveys of stakeholders, parent surveys, and other data review. Um, so when they talk about kind of the overall program and the different areas of improvement, um, Corey and the other NMFAP um, administrators are taking into account all of that information. But today we're gonna be um, talking specifically about the review we conducted. Um, and we conducted it over the site counties currently implemented. Um, I know many of you think in terms of um, judicial districts, um, because I come from CYFD and because of uh, the review kind of um, lends itself this way, I tend to talk about counties. So the site counties are Bernalillo County, Sandoval, Valencia, Cibola, and San Juan. There were three main components of this review and kind of the meat, the, the meat, the bread and butter, all of that that's of CFSR is case review. So that's taking a deep dive into families served by the, by the program um, and looking at the outcomes related to safety, permanency, and well-being. Um, and we reviewed 30 cases served from February 2020 to current. Um, second was a supplemental participant parent interview. So all of the families that were served by NMFAP um, and participated in the review were also um, interviewed specifically related to their experience with NMFAP. Um, we felt that was important because we really just wanted to get an understanding not only of how um, these families negotiated the child welfare system, but um, what their experience was of the NMFAP. And lastly was the stakeholder group interviews. We did a number of group um, interviews and we'll be going more in depth into each of these three areas. 
um, and really asked questions about um, how NMFAP is impacting um, the child welfare process for these families. And we got a lot of diverse information and a lot of, um, a lot of great feedback from those stakeholder groups. So we'll be talking about those today. So before I charge on, I'm gonna pause for just a second and see if there's any initial questions or comments. Um, did you, Corey, is there anything I've missed? No questions in the chat yet, Carla. Okay. No hands. Okay, great. Just jump in if there is. Um, okay, we can go to the next um, slide. Um, so the first part of the review we wanna talk about is the case review. As I mentioned, this is the 30 cases that mostly Nora looked at. She really took this on and reviewed um, the bulk of these cases. I think I did five and she did 25. And so, um, so she was looking at case records, she was interviewing case participants, um, and she was looking at court documents and um, utilizing the federal on-site review instrument um, round three version for the, for the purpose of collecting information. Um, can we go into the next slide? Um, I want to talk a little bit about what's different about this case review. Um, so I've said a few things about what's the same, which is we are using the federal review process. We um, followed the instructions for the on-site review instrument. We followed the guidance of um, the rating instructions. We consulted with Judy Mayfield to maintain consistency in terms of um, how we were rating things with not only the federal guidelines, but with CYFD. Um, what's different about this review is that we, instead of conducting the complete review instrument, we targeted specific items in permanency and well-being that were expected to have an impact by the NMFAP program. Um, and another key difference, aside from that we didn't complete the entire instrument, is um, we um, did not interview children and youth. This is a um, typically a required interview um, for CFSR when a child's old enough and has the capacity to participate in an interview. Um, but because of um, because of the fact that we were not um, agency reviewers, um, we needed we weren't authorized to do that um, interview without um, an IRB process. And so um, after kind of problem solving and negotiating around that, um, we decided to interview service providers or foster parents, a resource parents, or guardian ad litem youth attorney in each of those cases in order to get the perspective from the child youth. So that was um, one of the key differences. Another difference is that when CYFD or the federal um, review teams do the review, they typically have access to hard copy case records. And in our review, we relied on the case records from the um, automated uh, system fax at CYFD. So we were given access to the case records through fax and could get all the notes and different assessments. And we were also had access to all the court reports. Um, so we did not have the hard copy case files. Um, I think we were mindful of ensuring that we had sufficient information to complete the reviews. And I don't think we identified that there were any specific barriers related to those differences. Um, as we move on, I wanted to talk just a bit about which items we reviewed and give a really high level overview of what those are. So when we start talking about the data, you have an understanding of what was being measured. Um, so um, I think that you all got a cheat sheet <laughs> that has this information on it as well, um, kind of a one to two pager that has the specific items we reviewed for the NMFAP review. Um, this was taken directly from the Children's Bureau website, and I'm realizing I should have put that on the cheat sheet <laughs> because I basically copied it directly from, from their resource page. Um, and so um, 
that, that just so you know, that's where this information came from. The specific items reviewed that were expected to have an impact of MMFAP were um, items related to permanency outcome one, children have permanency and stability in their living situations. And we looked at items four, five, and six. Item four is specifically about foster care placement. Um, was that placement stable? Um, and if there were any changes in that placement, were those made to advance a child's permanency goal? So an example of that is say a child's in a non-relative resource home and moves to a relative home or moves to a home that's in closer proximity to a parent that they're expected to reunify with or moves to be placed together with a sibling. Those are all examples of moves that would, might be considered you know, good moves that advance permanency. So the reviewer is gonna be evaluating that. Other things that would not fall into that category would be say a, a child is moved from like one regular resource home to another non-relative resource home because of you know, insufficient services to support that family or an abuse neglect allegation or an overplacement you know, just those kind of disrupted placements, those kind of things would be considered, um, you know, not advancing the permanency goal. Um, I want to say that, you know, because NMFAP provides upfront advocacy for um, and communication and support for families in identifying relatives um, and other resource parents, um, that's one reason that we thought, okay, item four, we can expect that, um, we can expect that, um, you know, we might see some improvement in item four. Um, item five is, did the agency establish appropriate permanency goals for the child in a timely manner? Um, and so this is all about, you know, what is the goal? <laughs> is that goal appropriate? And um, did we establish it timely? So for example, if a child um, has been in care for 15 or more months or a certain amount of time and there's no parent progressing, there's nobody working towards um, achieving goals or rectifying the issues that brought the child into care um, and the plan hasn't been changed, okay, then the reviewer is going to have to start looking at, does that make sense? Is this, um, is this still the right goal? Um, item six is our efforts being made to achieve reunification, guardianship, adoption, or PPLA. Um, and so, um, you know, it's expected that NMFAP, because they're really there providing support and advocacy to parents, um, that, um, that we should see some positive outcomes in items five and six in terms of um, achieving permanency. Um, next slide. Um, permanency outcome two is the continuity of family relationships and connections is preserved for children. And in this area, we looked at items seven, eight, and 10. Item seven is all about, um, did the agency make concerted efforts to ensure that siblings in foster care are placed together? Um, unless there's some specific reason to have separation in order to meet the needs of one of those siblings. Um, item, item eight is, did the agency make concerted efforts to ensure that visitation between the child in foster care and his or her mother, father, and siblings placed separately was of sufficient frequency and quality to promote continuity of those relationships? And item 10 is, did the agency make concerted efforts to place with relatives when appropriate? And again, when evaluating these items, it was expected that NMFAP would have a positive outcome in these areas um, because of that um, enhanced advocacy, enhanced support, and enhanced um, communication. So that was part of the case review. And um, next slide. Lastly, we looked at well being outcome item one families have enhanced capacity to provide for their children's needs. Um, in this area, we specifically looked at item 12B, which is did the agency make concerted efforts to assess the needs of and provide services to parents um, in order to help them achieve their case goals and address issues relevant to the agency's involvement. Um, did the and item 13, did the agency make concerted efforts to involve parents and children in case planning 
and item 15 were the frequency and quality of visits between caseworkers and mothers and fathers sufficient to ensure safety, permanency, and well being of the children and promote achievement of case goals. Um, so I think before we hop into the actual outcomes, I'll just pause real quick to see if there's any questions. I know I ran through that super fast, um, but if there's any questions or clarification. Okay. Nothing in chat and no hands up that I'm seeing. Okay, great. Um, Nora, is there anything I missed that we should have said in that overview? So the only thing I wanted to add is that this is not just a review of CYFD or FAP, it's the whole child welfare community. Um, so maybe if you could talk a little bit about that, that would be helpful. Yeah, thank you, Nora. Um, that's a good reminder. Um, I think as we know, um, the child welfare system is complex. Um, it's a um, kind of constellation of many <laughs> systems. Um, there's a judicial system, there's CYFD, there's the providers, there's the families and relatives. Um, there's kind of the um, different support networks. There's the whole foster care system in terms of substitute care. And so all of these different um, entities really do impact. And so when we talk about the review, it can be easy to think of the review as being, this is a review of CYFD. And I know when I worked at CYFD, we all kind of felt that. <laughs> um, but the, um, uh, as Nora said, this is really a review of the system and it puts the, um, it puts the kind of onus on all of us who are engaged in the system to, to um, think about quality improvement and how we can work differently to improve outcomes for children and families. So thank you for that reminder. Carla, you do have a question now. What percentage must be achieved to get a rating of substantial conformity? Um, so in terms of um, this review, we did not talk um, specifically about a baseline for substantial conformity. Um, what we did look at was, um, you know, how we functioned in terms of um, comparison data to CYFD. Um, and then we're, we're going to go a little bit into that comparison data because, you know, there's a lot of kind of caveats around that. Um, but what we're, we're really looking at was a broader sense of did we, um, did we see improvements in these items that we were expecting to be positively impacted? Um, I guess what I'll say about substantial conformity and those measures too, is as we get into round four and as we did in round three, um, when the Children's Bureau works with CYFD in order to come up with all those baselines, I'll be looking at all the different data measures and making a decision about what, what needs to be achieved in the different cases. Sorry, I know that was a little vague. <laughs> okay, let's go into a little bit about the ratings. Um, and so for these 30 case reviews, this is a summary of the ratings that, we, that were ach um, achieved in each of these items. And so um, basically as Nora or I were doing this review, there's a series of questions you have to ask for each of these items and then a decision about whether or not the item rated a strength, an area needing improvement or not applicable, not applicable based upon those, um, those, the questions being answered. Gathering information for each of these items was you know, pretty intensive process of reading the case record, um, reading the court documents and reading and, and interviewing important people involved in the case. Those people were, included the parent, um, the, uh, CYFD worker or and or supervisor, um, the guardian ad litem um, and youth attorney or youth attorney, and in some cases, foster parents and resource parents and service providers. And so um, um, all of that information is kind of brought together and we're, we look at, uh, we come up with a rating for each um, item. Um, 
One thing I did want to mention about this process is when we're looking at the review, we look at a period under review. Um, and so for this particular review, we looked at tw a 12 month period. So it may or may not have um, included all of the time that the child was in care. And this is consistent with um, the federal process and with the CYFD process. So looking at the um, different um, rating summary for item four, um, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna kind of go through each of these, but I wanna just tell you what you're seeing. So for item four, um, 18 of the cases were rated as a strength um, at, for 60% and 40% of the cases were rated as an area needing improvement. So as we mentioned, um, that means in 60% of the cases, it found that the current placement was stable and that either there were no moves and the child was only in one placement during the period under review or um, that any moves that were made were in order to advance the permanency goal. Um, so same for item five, 70% of the cases rated for item five, so that's of those 30, um, were rated as a strength, meaning the permanency goal was appropriately appropriate given the case circumstances and established timely. And in 30% of the cases, it was determined to be an area needing improvement. In terms of efforts to achieve the goal of um, the permanency goal, 60% um, were rated a strength and 40% were rated in area needing improvement. And item six relies heavily on um, timeliness of achieving the goal. So we're looking at that standard of um, reunification within 12 months of entry, guardianship within um, 18 months of entry, and adoption within 24 months of entry. And so not to say there can't ever be a strength that goes beyond that, but we really start looking at, um, you know, what efforts were being made and, um, you know, if, if the achievement of that goal is imminent and if there was a reason that makes sense for it to go over that time frame. Um, placement with siblings, again, 81.25% um, was rated as a strength. Um, visiting, visiting with parents and siblings in foster care. So this is about the child's visitation with, um, with their parents. Um, is it frequent enough? Is it of good quality? Um, and um, same with any siblings placed separately. And those are siblings in foster care. Um, I wanna mention um, right here that we, um, when we're reviewing a case, we are looking at a target child. So there could be three or four children in the family, but we're really looking at the case through the lens of one child. Um, and so for this case, the for this review, the cases were all randomly selected for review. And if there was more, th more than one child in the family, then the target child was randomly selected. Um, and so that just so you know, that's how we kind of ended up with, with the children that we reviewed. Um, and all of that kind of review process and elimination criteria and different kind of ins and outs, nuts and bolts of the review plan um, are available and um, pretty, pretty well spelled out, I think. Um, relative placement, I think we mentioned at the top that um, kind of identifying and um, locating relatives for placement is um, a key aspect of um, the advocacy that NMFAP is doing. And so we expect expect there to be better outcomes related to relative placement. And in 66.67% um, of the cases, um, that was rated as a strength. Needs and services to parents. This is really all about were the parents' needs assessed adequately and were the right services provided um, in a timely manner. And that's 46.67%. Um, when we talk about these parent um, items, um, as we go a little further into the data, um, we did break down the data to show differences between the parent who was receiving NMFAP and the parent who was not receiving NMFAP when there were two parents engaged in the case. And so, um, so you know, just so you know, we'll be looking at this data again as well. Um, child and family involvement in case planning. This is really about do parents and do children who are able and are old enough have um, a voice 
um, in their case planning? Are they providing input into their strengths and needs? What type of services they like? What their challenges are? Um, are they monitoring their progress? Is the plan um, being updated with their input? And so, um, you know, this is another area where NMFAP was really advocating and supporting families. And so we expect a positive outcome related to this. Um, so in 56.67% of the cases we reviewed, um, that was rated as a strength. And caseworker visits with the parents, this relates to the CYFD caseworker. Um, and um, the, you know, uh, we're again looking at the frequency and the quality of those contacts between the caseworker and their parent and expecting NMFAP to have a positive um, impact on that outcome because of the advocacy component. And in 36.67% of the cases, that was a strength. Okay, next slide. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this NMFAP and CYFD review rating comparison and then pause a little bit for questions um, because I know this is a whole bunch of numbers coming. <laughs> Um, but wanna, wanna just kind of give this um, rating comparison. Um, before we go into the numbers of this though, I really wanna talk about this being a comparison. Um, from this particular review, we cannot, um, you know, say apples to apples. This is not kind of um, um, a peer comparison. Um, and part of the reason is that CYFD conducts ongoing CY or ongoing quality assurance reviews um, using the on-site review instrument, just as we did in this case. Um, and But they pull their um, sample of cases from all children in custody in um, a given county. And so those children represent a much um, broader kind of universe of kids. They could have been kids that have been in care for years and years. Um, they are kids with all different kinds of case plans, adoption, guardianship, PPLA. Um, whereas when we took the NMFAP sample, we were really looking at just the cases that were served by NMFAP since its implementation. And those were relatively, really all newer cases. These are kids who've entered care um, recently or you know, within the last uh, couple years. Um, and um, they are um, overwhelmingly reunification cases. So there's a bit of a difference. Um, CYFD um, gave us access to their ratings um, for the different counties. So when we look at the CYFD ratings, they're for the specific counties served by NMFAP over the past, um, I think, two, three years. Um, and so just so you know, like, um, I hope that makes sense that it's not kind of a direct comparison, um, but it gives us some context in terms of how to think about where NMFAP is um, supporting or potentially influencing positive outcomes in these areas. Um, so as we look through the ratings, you can see that um, the first um, column is the NMFAP strength ratings. The middle column is the CYFD strength ratings. And then there's a difference column, which basically is just doing the math, hopefully right, <laughs> doing the math to see, okay, um, did we see improved um, outcomes in these areas as we expected? Um, so for items five and six, we did see improved outcomes. We saw that um, in, um, you know, slightly more of the cases, um, there was a, a per, the permanency goal for the child was determined to be appropriate and established in a timely manner. So it's just like a little bit above the CYFD strength rating area. And for item six, we saw a pretty significant difference, almost 30%, like 29.5% of the cases that received NMFAP um, were um, determined to be a strength um, in terms of efforts to achieve reunification, guardianship, and adoption. So we, and most of those were reunification cases. So we, you know, think that this supports kind of the premise that NMFAP 
um, advocacy, support, and communication um, supports that outcome, improvements in those outcome. In the other areas, we did not see that difference. Um, we saw that um, we did not see the expected um, or hoped for um, bump in outcome measures for NMFAP cases. Um, I'm going to pause for a second and I'm going to ask Nora first if there's anything that I didn't mention related to these comparisons that would be helpful. For example, in item 12B, does that include both FAP and non FAP parent in the rating? Yes. So good clarification. So for the items that include parents, um, so like item 12B, item 13, item 15, um, that would be rated for both the parent who received NMFAP and the parent who did not receive FAP. And so the way the CFSR on-site review instrument works is you have to get a strength for everything in order to get a strength for the item. So we are gonna break down in a minute, um, looking just at the NMFAP parents or the parents who received NMFAP, um, but this is overall. So yes, um, um, you know, spoiler alert, we did see that the family, that the parents who received NMFAP did perform um, better in these items um, than looking at both parents. So thanks, Nora. Um, any other questions or comments from the group on this data before we kind of move forward? Okay. No, we can go to the next questions. One. Okay, thanks, Twyla. Okay, so this is what we were just talking, talking about. We really wanted to see um, how was the NMFAP client particip um, performing versus the overall NMFAP rating. Um, and so as we know, um, in terms of the model as it's currently being implemented, um, one parent, um, receives the services of NMFAP um, and the other parent um, is assigned the more traditional route with a respondent attorney. And so what we found in those items that look at parents, that NMFAP, when we take out the parent who does not receive NMFAP, the ratings um, for these particular items increase. Um, for item eight, visiting with parents and siblings in foster care, um, there was um, an increase in over 12% to a strength rating. For needs and services to parents, um, there was an increase of just about 10%. And for child and family involvement in case planning, um, the increase was over 16%. And for caseworker visits with parents, 13%. And so one of the things that this told us or you know, that we're thinking about is that really the families who or the parents who received this increased advocacy and this increased support and the communication of the NMFAP team um, had a bump in these outcome areas um, as opposed to the overall um, parent rating. Um, so we just thought it was important to kind of pull that out because that is one piece of this program um, is that there could be two parents in the, involved in the case, but only one of them is receiving this enhanced service. Um, next slide. Oh, okay. Let me pause again and just uh, touch base to see if Nora has anything to add there or any other questions. Before we talk Thank about you. Okay. So the supplemental parent interview, um, you know, as we were talking about what this review would look like and how to really get um, a complete picture of um, NMFAP as it relates to the outcomes, one thing that we needed to acknowledge was that this the on-site review instrument, that case review in and of itself 
doesn't really review NMFAP, right? It reviews the outcomes um, that that family experiences in relation to the child welfare system. So NMFAP is part of that child welfare system, but we wanted to dig a little deeper and get some specific feedback about how parents were experiencing um, this service. And so at the conclusion of each of the interviews that parents participate in um, to inform the case review, they were asked specific interview questions related to NMFAP. And this interview really focused on things like the frequency and quality of their contact with NMFAP, the types of support and um, advocacy NMFAP provided, and their overall um, guess, uh, satisfaction with NMFAP. And um, we also asked them for their feedback about what could um, be done to improve NMFAP, um, where additional services or supports might have been warranted. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit, next slide, about the outcome of that supplemental parent interview. Um, so this is the, so uh, this is 30 parents who were interviewed. Um, and um, one of the things we wanted to ask them is just how often are they meeting with their different um, folks in their NMFAP team. Um, and so you can see here for the 30, um, in 30 of the 30 cases, an attorney was assigned. In all of the cases, there was a social worker assigned. And in 10 of the cases, there was the parent mentor assigned. And so we asked them how frequently they met with those folks. And this is what they told us. For their um, attorney meetings, it was just over 36% was twice per month. They were meeting with their social worker 33% of the time weekly, and they were meeting with the parent mentor um, monthly 40% of the time. And so this just gives us a sense of how much contact. Um, I will say that kind of in the initial um, designing of this, we were really focused on face-to-face -face meetings between NMFAP and, um, and the parent. Um, but this was an area that was impacted across the board by COVID. So there were face-to-face -face meetings, there were Zoom meetings, there were all the alternative contacts, phone calls, text messages, things like that. Um, so there was a lot of different alternative contacts. So it could be a little difficult to tease out when interviewing the parent how much of that was um, kind of in-person face-to-face versus um, through technology. Um, what I would, will say about that, though, is my, um, in reading all of these interviews, the parents were quite positive about that alternative contact, um, and that it was really the frequency and that kind of availability of the team that um, resonated with them. So they, a lot, a lot of people talked about things like text chains and um, email groups and different ways that they were staying apprised. Um, Nora, can you... If, do you have anything to add about, about that piece in terms of frequency with parents? Um, no, I would say overall, I think the family or the parents were satisfied with that frequency. They didn't feel like they needed more. Um, they did feel like they had access to any of the FAP team members um, as needed, whether it was GP to, you know, kind of cry on someone's shoulder or to ask a specific question about an issue. Um, so I think overall they were they were satisfied with what they received. Thank you. Um, next slide. Um, another thing we asked them about is what specific types of activities um, is your NMFAP team supporting you with? And um, I'm going to give a little caveat on this data because, um, you know, uh, what it doesn't take into account is kind of the not applicables. <laughs> so if we if there if we had like kind of a yes response to this, I coded it as that yes, NMFAP um, helped me with this activity. But there were some times when we would ask them, um, you know, what about transportation? And the parent would say, I didn't need any of that. I have my own car or that's not an issue for me. So they weren't really saying they weren't helped. <laughs> and so this data is really just giving the positive of like which, which parents said that these activities. 
Um, so overwhelmingly, um, we had positive responses from parents about the support and advocacy they received from NMFAP. And you can see that in terms of those top um, few categories, helping to communicate with CYFD, helping to understand um, court proceedings, helping to access services, and having input into case plan. Those are all over 90%. And this is specifically related to that parent's, um, that parent's perception of the advocacy and support they received from NMFAP. Hey, Give Carla, um, I'm going to jump in yeah. for just a second before you go to the next piece and remind everybody it's 1255. We know some of you have to log off soon here if you have a one o'clock appointment or hearing. Just want to remind you again to please remember to fill out the post-session survey. Um, Corey put the link in the chat um, and Corey, if you can put it up there again, we really appreciate that. Um, and uh, and just remind everybody else that we'll continue till 1.15. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, next, we wanted to talk about the stakeholder group interviews. And the purpose of these group interviews was to really bring together um, key stakeholders who interface with these families and the child welfare system and get their input about how NMFAP um, is supporting um, families and improving outcomes or areas where there's challenges or needing improvement or just um, things to pay attention to. And so we did a lot of stakeholder group interviews and got a lot of great feedback. And I know uh, many of you here today um, participated in those. So thank you so much for, for doing that. It was key. And we did model the stakeholder group interview process on the federal process as well. We adapted it um, to get information that we, um, you know, were seeking for um, evaluation of NMFAP, but we used kind of this process that the um, Children's Bureau outlines. And um, I conducted those stakeholder interviews and Nora and Judy attended and provided support and took really detailed notes so that we were able to distill this information. Um, there's a lot more information in the final report. So if you're interested in looking at that, um, I please um, encourage you to do so. It's not, it doesn't go on forever. It's like 15 pages or something. So, so it's light reading. Um, these are the different groups we talked to. Talk to. Um, we talked to um, NMFAP folks, the social workers and parent advocates. We talked to respondent attorneys who are assigned to NMFAP. We talked to the administrative team of NMFAP. We had two sessions with the guardian and litems and youth attorneys from the NMFAP site counties and had really great participation there. Um, we talked with judges um, from the NMFAP site counties. And we also had um, several sessions with CYFD caseworkers and supervisors from the NMFAP site counties. So we did multiple sessions in the different counties um, and got a pretty good representation um, from CYFD as well. And so I again wanted to thank um, specifically Natividad and Jennifer Archuleta Earp, who really got um, staff there and supported this review process by um, making, um, you know, kind of uh, getting their staff to the stakeholder interviews and also um, facilitating their participation in the case review. So next slide. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the strengths that came out of the stakeholder interviews. Um, one was um, improved parent engagement, enhanced advocacy, better communication, um, a support for parents linking to services, increased parent involvement and professional training and support. Um, and the professional training and support, I'm going to say, is specifically these ECHO sessions were called out um, on some numerous stakeholder groups. So um, that was, um, I think, part of this process that necess doesn't necessarily about the case review or anything, but this, these ECHO sessions have been really identified as a strength. Um, so a lot of the strengths that we heard about were echoed in the parent interviews. Parents talked about you know, feeling more engaged, feeling like they had somebody they could ask questions to, feeling like they understood the process better, 
that they had someone in their corner, and that this was really borne out by the other stakeholders. Many of them talked about parents being engaged, parents showing up for court, um, uh, parents um, giving input into their case plan, parents coming to the case planning meetings at CYFD and different, um, different aspects of that. Um, and so, you know, all of those are things that, you know, were specific goals of the NMFAP program. And so, you know, we saw those echoed from the stakeholder interviews. Um, we also um, heard about challenges and areas needing improvement or sometimes just areas for attention um, related to NMFAP. And one of the things we heard across really all of the groups was about assignment of NMFAP teams um, and equity of services. So because um, NMFAP was assigned to one parent in a case and not the other, um, many people said sometimes a parent who really needed the service didn't get it, or sometimes a parent who wasn't that engaged got assigned the team and it was really the other parent who could have used it. We had many of the parents tell us, I wish this was available for all, everybody. I wish my husband or my ex-wife or somebody could have had the same support. It made a difference. And so this was a challenge, um, I think, um, related to resources, related to program design, related to grant evaluation, um, a bunch of different aspects um, that really um, was seen by the stakeholders and identified as a challenge of the program. Um, next, a challenge that was kind of became a theme was communication between CYFD and MFAP and the parent and this concern about triangulation and concern about, um, you know, uh, barriers to building rapport with clients because there's kind of like another person involved, um, scheduling meetings with multiple people involved, um, you know, not always having direct access to a parent and worries that the parent is saying one thing to CYFD, another thing to NMFAP. And um, my impression of this challenge as, as folks were talking about this is that um, this was especially concerning to folks at the implementation level, but as the program rolled out in different counties, there were strategies involved to mitigate this concern. One was, you know, people, a lot of people talked about these group texts, these group emails to keep everyone on the same page. Um, many of the counties had um, developed weekly or um, biweekly check-ins with NMFAP um, in order to keep those cases running along and being smooth and with the parent as well. And so um, I think that this was a worry and it was a concern at implementation. And then it was something that was um, consistently addressed. And so, you know, we had stakeholders talking about um, being very worried about this at the onset of kind of implementation and then um, working towards resolution about that. Another concern that came up is um, that the program just in and of itself prioritizes parents' rights over the best interest of the child. And that, you know, there is this advocacy component, there is a focus on um, advocating for parents, for supporting them in communicating, um, and that that, um, and that the goal in those cases is um, most often reunification, and that sometimes the concern is that reunification is being pushed too quickly, or that the family is receiving so much support during the course of the case through NMFAP. And then when it goes to trial home, visit or, trial home visit or dismissal, a lot of that support is pulled away and there's worries about, you know, have the parents um, demonstrated um, enough of a change um, related to um, the reasons a child entered care in the first place. And so, you know, there's just worries about um, how the impact of the advocacy is having on kind of the long-term outcomes for kids. Um, and so those were kind of the broad themes in terms of strengths and challenges. Um, I do, I know we're gonna come up on time pretty quickly here, but I wanna toss to Nora real quick and see if there's anything I forgot or that I need to clarify. <laughs> no, I think you've covered it. I think it's good. Okay. Um, and Twyla, is there any questions or um, 
Anything else that's popping up, Kat? Not that I'm noticing. Leslie, did I miss anything? No, I'm not seeing anything in the chat or any hands up either. But there's still time if you do have a question, okay. please raise your hand. Um, Yes, thank you, Twyla. No, I'd we'd love to hear um, hear any questions or discussion points um, that you all are pop for you all as we go through these results. And again, I encourage you to look at the full report and to um, dive a little deeper into the data. Um, I'm not positive if Angela is still here, and I I'm not going to put her on the spot, but if she wants to chime in and say anything about the CYFD quality assurance process, I would also invite her to to do that if she if she's here and can do that. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, I think just in preparing for round four CFSRs, you know, we're on the ball, um, always helpful. I mean, willing to help out as much as we can, especially for this type of review. Um, so I'm just really glad to see that it was done. I know that the QA team with, C with CYFD is getting ready to train on all the round four stuff. So there are going to be um, some slight changes moving forward. Um, nothing too significant, but there definitely are some things um, to look at, including, you know, uh, just how we're assessing for risk and providing services to address risk uh, and such and such. So however we can be a help to you guys, you know, that's what we're here for. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> Thanks for all your help on this. Um, uh, Corey, Twyla, I know we've had lots of discussions. Is there anything that um, I forgot to mention or that you want to highlight? Um, I just really want to thank you, Carla and Nora and Judy. Judy, I guess, had some technical difficulties and couldn't make it on today. Um, but I really just want to thank you all for all the work that you put in to these reviews. They are very labor intensive. Um, I've learned a lot also from the process. It's, it's just a lot of work. And thank you for um, this presentation today. And um, to all of you here in the call, um, because many of you participated as um, you know in the stakeholder interviews and provided your feedback, um, I just would add that um, I think the next step, because this is a continuous quality improvement effort, we're going to be looking at all of this data, looking at um, you know the challenges that were just brought up by Carla and thinking about ways that we can mitigate some of that and some of those challenges. And so we'll likely be having discussions with many of you, in particular CYFD, about um, just ways we can improve, work better together on cases and things of that nature. So that's sort of like the next step in this process, right? We've done this review. Now, what do we do with this information? How do we improve our program? So that's what we'll be focusing on um, here forward. And I don't have anything else to add unless Twyla or anyone else um, wanted to say something. Um, just to chime in, but definitely, Definitely appreciate Carla, Nora, and um, Judy, and also everybody's participation. And we'll be also in addition to try, uh, addition to sharing and working with CYFD, also OFRA, uh, we're working on that transition process for the Office of Family Representation and Advocacy, so that this data will also hopefully um, be able to be used there to, to avoid some of our life learning lessons. <laughs> so, but thank you to everybody. And I still don't see any questions. So Carla, I think you're good, but if there, if I missed anybody, please chime in. Are there any um, of the Children's Bureau folks on the line? I don't know if they wanna chime in at all around uh, Heather is here. I'm not sure Heather was anybody else here. I don't think so, but thanks for considering me Children's Bureau. <laughs> Even though I'm not. <laughs> you're, you're a bridge. <laughs> a bridge, bridge to the Children's Bureau. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Great. 
Other than that, thank you everybody for being here today. Um, I can't hear you. Are you talking? Oops, did I lose my mic? I may have lost my mic. We can hear you. Oh, we can hear you. May just speak. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. I was just gonna say thank you everybody for being here. Um, you know, we're looking forward to being able to utilize this data in the um, CQI process. So thank you everyone. So again, and I just wanna remind everybody, please fill out the survey. Um, the, the link is in the, in the chat um, for you. Um, we really appreciate that. And also wanna encourage you to join us for the next ECHO session. That'll be November 15th on system-based trauma responsive information gathering. And that will be, um, presented by Dr. George Davis. And if you have attended any of his before, he is really a great presenter, very engaging, and, and um, there's a lot of good information. So I wanna encourage everyone to attend that next month. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Yes, thank you everyone. And thank you, Leslie, for the reminder. That will be a good, really will be a good one. I hope everybody has a great afternoon. I apologize for having my toolbar in the presentation section. I could not for the life of me figure out how to get it off and then I finally did, but then I couldn't open the chat because then it would revert back to the screen that was being shared. So I couldn't, I was deferring to Twyla to help me with that. So I think it was okay, but I apologize for a little bit of that messing. Yeah, that's why I started chiming in. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now. Just realized it's still going. <laughs>